Joygasmers out there, and welcome back to Joygasm, a video game and movie podcast. I'm Russ, and I am looking forward to having it be my turn to go to Hogwarts in episode 315 today, April 4th, 2023. We're going to be getting right into our topic of the day, which is... Hogwarts Legacy Gameplay Impressions. Now, this is a game that came out earlier this year, so I, am, in fact, am a little bit of a late bloomer, if you will, when it comes to this game. And I had some friends who have already been playing through the game, and they kept speaking very highly of it. They kept saying, Russ, you gotta check this game out. It's really, really good. And... To give you some context, so I am a Harry Potter fan, but I'm not a diehard Harry Potter fan. I couldn't tell you all the intricate details of every little thing, but I'm one of those fans who really discovered Harry Potter through the movies themselves. And I'll have you know that I finally started reading the books. In fact, I'm reading the Sorcerer's Stone with my eight-year-old daughter. So we're having that like little daddy-daughter bonding time, which is, uh, I think, very appropriate given the fact that the first book takes place mm, a couple of years later than eight. But, you know, I think I think it's a really good starting point. So looking into that and especially going back to my experience at the theater, I was very impressed with this world that J.K. Rowling had cultivated and created and how seeing all of these different types of characters come to life and the world itself, this wizarding world that that she had manifested was truly something special. And so it was interesting when I first saw a trailer for Hogwarts Legacy. I was actually a bit underwhelmed, to be honest with you. When I was looking at it, it didn't seem next-gen. It seemed like it was kind of, uh, from a graphical perspective, almost last-gen. And so I ended up writing it off, thinking, well, I guess it's just one of those uh, movie license to game situations where they they're trying to bank off the name itself but the in terms of the actual um guts of the the game engine it's not that good well lo and behold i was wrong and i'm so glad that i was in fact wrong because oh my goodness gracious this is this is one of the best games i've played this year uh, let, let's let's just start right there so Looking at the initial sales, so Hogwarts Legacy sold over 12 million copies and raked in $850 million in sales globally and in just its first two weeks uh, of release. And as of this recording, I believe the game has been out now for, I want to say six weeks, somewhere in there. And so if they were able to generate $850 million out the gate of the first two weeks, I'm sure they've already breached a billion dollars in sales worldwide and then some. So I think there will be some new sales metrics that will be released probably in the next two weeks or so, because we're in April right now. I think it's like mid April is when the next announcement comes out. So I'm very curious to see what those numbers are. And I also learned, too, that the game itself is actually released only for next-gen platforms. So PS5, Xbox Series X, and PC. And the idea is is that later on this year, they are going to release a version that is compatible with PS4 and Xbox One X, in which case they will probably see another bump in sales once that becomes available. So worth mentioning alone because this has been um, uh, apparently a very highly anticipated title. I'm not too sure how well the previous um, kind of Harry Potter-ish games that have been released in the past have fared, but 
if this is any any indication, I think that the license itself is incredibly strong still. It's amazing how the books have done so well as they have. The films have been a phenomenal success. The merchandise has been a big deal. I have yet to even go and see the, the Hogwarts attraction at Universal Studios. That's something that I've also heard a lot of great things about. So I can't wait to take my family there at some point. Um, so I, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely, it's funny because as a Harry Potter fan, you know, I, I find myself kind of weaving in and out of certain things, or maybe I'm a little late to the party. So this is one of those instances, instances where like, you know, I'm a little late. It's not too bad, but you know, I definitely was not there right when the game dropped and, um, reading different articles and threads on Reddit. There are already people who have beaten this game and, and are going back through on like their second or third journey. So I have a bunch of things written down that I wanted to talk to all of you about regarding this game. I think first and foremost, um, the wizarding world of Hogwarts, you know, Hogwarts legacy itself is absolutely gorgeous. I honestly, I'm stunned. I was not prepared for the level of graphics fidelity that I see in this game. And again, that's saying something because for whatever reason, the trailer I saw it, like, I think it was like last year's E3 or something, something to that effect. The trailer really did not show off at least the one that I saw. Um, what I'm seeing in this game. And it, it is absolutely fantastic. I, I do want to say that the architecture within all these different places, but, you know, predominantly within Hogwarts, it is a feast for the eyes. It's amazing how I just blissfully get lost walking around through the various rooms and halls and tiers of this amazing enchanted castle and I think that the uh, the ray tracing along with the HDR combined and the the texture work on the various pieces of architecture whether it's granite or marble or you see tapestries or you know certain types of rugs or whatever that, that you are taking a look at it is absolutely gorgeous and it's not limited to just the architecture and interior parts of the of the game but also the exterior when you go into the open world and you're going outside the outside is very beautiful you have all kinds of lovely trees you have very detailed rock fixtures and facings and whatnot you have the time of day and night which is fantastic the the different characters you come across also look great so, I mean, it, it really is an impressive game, visually speaking, for sure. Um, on top of that, the combat is something that I was personally very curious about because in the films, for instance, you don't really see a whole lot of actual combat going on. Like, yeah, you see some of the, the, the witches and wizards from the dark arts and whatnot who are like kind of doing like the, the um, dashing and, and like, you know, they, they disappear and reappear over here, that sort of thing. Or like, you know, if two wizards are like using their, their wands and you have like this kind of sh this colorful stream kind of going back and forth to see who has more magical power kind of thing. That's kind of the extent of what the movies were showing in terms of that type of combat. And so I was thinking to myself, okay, how are they going to make this exciting? How are they going to make this intense? And I got to I got to hand it to Avalanche Studios, you know, Avalanche Studios, which is uh, the developer of this game. And apparently Warner Brothers has created this this new entity called uh, I think it's Port Key Games or something to that effect. And that's that essentially focuses on the Harry Potter franchise or the IP. They have really also done a successful job at the combat mechanics. And so it's it's a lot of fun to be able to. Um, you know, if, if you're shooting your wand and you have like, like these different types of little, like kind of, uh, not fireballs, although you do have fire as one of the spells you can do, but like, it's almost like these like kind of energy balls that, that you're, you're throwing at your opponent is a lot of fun. You have a dodge ability to roll out of the way. You can jump around. Um, and, and of course, because we are in the wizarding world, 
it's all about the spells, right? So this game delivers an absolute ton of different types of spells. I am currently about 10 hours into the game. So I'm, I, I think I'm still toward the kind of the, the beginning part. And I've read about how I think people, if you want hundred percent, the game is you're probably looking at about 90 hours. And may, for me, you know, I like to take my time and I don't like to rush through games like this. So I'm probably looking at easily a hundred hours. And it's amazing to me looking at the different types of spells that I've unlocked or learned thus far. And it's fantastic because you have certain spells that, that allow you to, to push objects or enemies away from you or bring them to you. You can have um, different types of uh, items or enemies float up in the air. You know, they, they've definitely incorporated different types of combos that you can do depending on the enemy class and what kind of defensive spells that they've manifested in order to counter whatever it is you're doing to them. And all of that really plays into this feeling, this sensation of an exciting battle, whatever that may be. You know, if you're fighting, uh, say, a bunch of spiders or if, say, you come across some uh, evil wizards or witches in the in the Forbidden Forest, whatever it may be, um, it definitely has payoff. It's a lot of fun. And, I mean, I, I've been finding all kinds of um, other types of spells. Honestly, again, I, I can't remember like what the actual names of those spells are. I do have friends who are like huge Harry Potter fans. They can name each and every one of them, but unfortunately I can't do that. Having said that though, I can tell you that I've probably unlocked at least a dozen spells by now, if not more. And one of the things that is worthy of note is the way that they have the control scheme set up with your spell casting is it's based off of the four buttons that are on the controller. So whether you're on a PS5 or you're on an Xbox Series X, you have those four main buttons which you can assign what kind of spells you want and you can replace those spells with new spells, however you like. So it's really nice to be able to customize that. On top of that, there is also this ability to um, unlock additional, I don't even know what really what to call it, but, but essentially like you have four additional spaces um, that basically represent, I think there are like three or four of those, almost like not, not in terms of like being connected to the D pad per se, but what's nice is that you can silo specific types of spells. So like for me, I have like one particular set that's like the uh, offense set, right? And then I have another set that's kind of using more of the search and discovery oriented spells or maybe some of the ones where I can conjure up things or alter things. So it's not that big as much of a deal. Um, and then I have a third one, which tends to be more of like the defense, for example, like your shields and so forth. And so that's actually really nice. I was, I was a little concerned initially wondering, okay, how is this going to play out? Because if you're in the heat of battle, how are you going to know? But really it's more of like a muscle memory thing. So once you've customized it, how you want it, essentially you're conditioning your mind to like understand, okay, if I need this spell, then, you know, I do this button combination to like bring up that particular set of spells. And so far it hasn't been a, a bad experience at all. Now, um, the VO in this game, the voiceovers is also well done. And of course, when I think of the films, you know, they have, this whole litany of fantastic actors that are all British, um, that, you know, they, they, they were able to leverage and really bring home that, that kind of more UK type of representation that, that, uh, the books had as well. And so it's nice to see how from a voiceover standpoint, they were able to continue that into this game. And so you have a lot of really nice performances. I really haven't come across anything I can think of yet. The only kind of awkward one was there was one woman who had, a, it, her voice was like super low. It sounded almost like a male voice. And I thought that was kind of like jarring because you're visually looking out and you see it's like, oh, it's, it's this adult woman, but it's almost like the recording got swapped or something. I'm not exactly sure, but that sounds like more of a technicality thing. 
Um, in terms of the performances, though, the performances are right there. And as a result, you know, it just immerses me as a player that much more. The um, And it's, it, speaking of immersive, so one of the most strongest aspects to Harry Potter, the world of Harry Potter, is this notion of it being this enchanted environment. And this game really does a nice job of that. It, you, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you're walking through Hogwarts and the place just feels alive. It truly does. It feels like you're walking through this place that is just filled to the brim with magic. There are all kinds of unpredictable scenarios or situations. You have, um, you know, uh, armored knights that that are in position that will move you have of course the paintings on the walls that also will kind of move around have their own personality types you have the poltergeists and the ghosts moving around you have uh flying books in the air or maybe papers and i mean you have keys with the wings on i mean like everywhere you go the whole place is just this very organic live feeling place and it has that whimsical charm that I was hoping for and then some. So I think that that's, that's really cool. And I also think too, in terms of some of the, the scripted events that go on, like, you know, if you have a room that suddenly gets changed up and you, and you have the architecture itself realigning itself and moving things around and all of a sudden you, it, it reveals something else entirely. I love that. I love how they were really smart in animating the architecture within certain parts of the castle, as well as if you're outside of Hogwarts, if you're at Hogsmeade or um, you're in like some kind of dungeon or cave, whatever that may be, there is just this, this constant quality of the unpredictable, which I love. It's, it's almost as if the magic quality is sentient in nature and it, it's like it also it is it's simpatico with how you know it, with these witches and wizards they all have their little spells and charms that they do and some of them may be puzzles some of them may be uh, a means to an end or there's a trial or a test or something like that but I don't know I think the concept of all of these different spells and charms coexisting in this space and like you know it, it, it's it's almost a, a kind of a a concoction of you know what happens like when you when you're placed in that environment and if you trigger this thing over here does it cause this other thing to happen or whatnot i don't know i think that is really cool because the magic at that point becomes a character unto itself just like hogwarts in this game is definitely a character unto itself now, the music is also fantastic. You can clearly tell that they are drawing inspiration from John Williams, who was the composer for the Harry Potter films. I want to say that they have taken some riffs from what John Williams did, but then they built upon it too. So they have their own original music and it sounds great. I mean, it definitely, once again, it immerses me as a gamer into the game. There are soothing aspects. Um, there are moments of um, danger or, or moments of comic relief or moments of charm. It just really depends on, on what's happening. But yeah, I mean, the, the music, I got to say, is, is also top notch. Um, one of the critiques I do have of the game so far, and again, this is just me playing for the first 10 hours, right? is I noticed that the characters that I've met are not the same kind of misfit caliber that we saw in the films. And I know that um, more often than not, those tended to be the, the defense against the dark arts professors. But on top of that too, you also had some of these other types of personalities that really help to kind of em embellish some of these, these classic personas that are associated with like wizards or witches or whatever. And, 
And so like Hagrid, for example, was a fantastic. He's probably one of my favorite characters from the Harry Potter movies. And uh, Dumbledore is another great character. There are even other types of like like the the um, and again I apologize I don't know all the names but there was one professor uh, specifically from Sorcerer's Stone um, who was played by the same actor who was Willow and uh, it was when he was teaching the kids how to like levitate a feather in the first film I just loved how he looked I loved how he sounded I loved how he acted and so far I really haven't come across that in this game the the humans that I come across are pleasant. You know, they have a nice sense of fashion about them and they're, they're pleasant enough with their personalities, but they all are kind of within the same cookie cutter approach of being very prim and proper. But I, I kind of want to see, you know, where, where is the, the, prof- the professor Snape, right? Where is the Hagrid? Where is like, you know, th- these, these different types of characters that, not only are their personalities one that are more like misfits or um, more eccentric in nature, but also their body types, you know, like how they look. Are they are they super small? Are they super giant? Who knows? Um, and even the way they dress, too. Like, like, you know, not every single person in this game has to be real fashionable. And so it's not something that, like, I've written off as like, oh, this is just how the whole game is, because obviously... I haven't seen most of the game. So my hope is, is that as I go along, there will be other types of um, characters that help to kind of flesh out, you know, add more meat to the bone, so to speak, in terms of the cast of characters. Now, the other critique I have with the game so far is the gear system. So when you start out, you have, I believe, 20 slots for all of your gear. So the gear itself consists of gloves, scarves, jackets, shirts, hats, glasses. Uh, I think I might be missing one, like a cloak or something like that. So, I mean, that's eight uh, different sections of your gear. So you can see how quickly you can get up to 20. And so they have this peculiar approach to gear in the sense that you don't have, at least my understanding so far is you do not have any kind of foot locker or place to actually store various types of gear at all. Like you are limited to just those 20 slots. And so if I go to a chest and I want to um, open the chest and get the loot, I can't actually take the loot because my gear is already maxed out. Now, what's weird also is, is that, you know, they give you the option to be able to destroy like a piece of gear if you want to. So I've done that on a few occasions. But then what I've noticed is that the chest that I I was wanting to get something out of, sometimes the item no longer is in there. And that, I don't know if is a bug or if that's by design, but I feel like that is a bit of an issue just because it seems like if it's by design, it's punishing me as the gamer for having um, all my gear slots already filled up. When in fact, I think it should be more about, okay, Let's do inventory management, right? Like I have to make a decision. Do I want to forfeit one of the other items I have in, in my gear inventory or not? And based off of that, then that, that item should always be in the chest. You know, so if I need to come back later on and pick it up, I should be able to do so. Or if I want to pick it up right then and there, I should be able to do that as well. So kind of on the fence on that, not exactly sure what to make of that particular situation. Now, I do know that they have the Merlin trials. I don't know if if they call it, if it's technically trials of Merlin or the Merlin trials, but (laughs) that's what it it is. Essentially, in in a nutshell, that's what it is. And so as you go along and you solve these different Merlin trials, then you begin to open up additional gear slots, which is cool. It's like, okay, that's a nice reward. However, what's interesting too is that there are a number of the uh, the trials that I've come across where it's very evident that 
I am missing a certain type of spell in order to manipulate the different objects to solve whatever the puzzle might be. So that unto itself is also a little awkward because if I set my mind as a gamer, like, okay, I want to be able to focus on just all of the Merlin trials and, and be able to um, unlock all these slots because clearly I want to be able to have options for my, my uh, fashion of dressing my character, right? So I'm limited with that because it's, it's all based on when the game starts to dole out new spells to me, in which case then I'm able to uh, continue doing those types of, of trials. At the same time, you know, it, it is interesting too, just knowing that I'm a student at Hogwarts and we have our quarters, right? So like for me, I'm a Hufflepuff and I just expect that since I'm, I'm living in the Hufflepuff quarters, they have all the bedrooms, they have all the closet spaces, everything. I mean, it just, it, from um, a visual standpoint, it's like, yeah, it's a no brainer. Of course, my character would have like a foot locker or a closet or a dresser or something where I can actually go to and just drop off gear if I want to. Just if for nothing else, if I wanted to have the freedom and the options to be able to um, kind of combine different types of, of outfits, or maybe maybe I get tired of the outfit I'm wearing and I want to go try out something else. And that actually brings up another question I have, which is, does this game support being able to transmogify um, different types of outfits that perhaps maybe like the initial stats are weaker because I found a, a particular outfit item earlier in the game, but is there a way that I can actually transfer the stats from say something else that maybe I don't like the look of onto a piece of clothing or wardrobe that I do like so I can still enjoy the stronger stats, but then also enjoy the, that particular aesthetic. I don't know if the game offers that or not. Again, I haven't gotten too far into uh, the game to be able to make a, a conclusive, uh, observation on that now going back to the the, the components of magic um, in my 10 hours of play and I made a list here so I, that way I, I, I wouldn't I kind of forget too many of these but you know in the 10 hours of play I've been able to learn how to brew potions I've been consistently learning how to do new spells I've learned how to fly on a broomstick, which is super fun. I'll talk more about that in a bit. Um, there is, you know, speaking of apparel, there is a huge variety of wizard apparel that is so fun. It's just great to come across all these different types of options for dressing your character. There's the defense against the dark arts. We have, um, <laughs> I can't remember if it's herbology or a, I totally, yeah. Uh, that's not, and that's not what, that's not what they call it. They call it something else, but essentially it's, it's the, you know, the, the biology of plants, um, the outpost messages, chasing flying keys. Like I mentioned before, revealing hidden items. I mean, just being able to run amok and, and cast Revelio or whatever it's called and be able to find different things to collect. All of these components are what contribute to this magical world and it's it's I don't know like it's impressive for me as a gamer to look at how they have painstakingly you know gone through the books and gone through the films and looked at okay what did these characters do and how can we in you know implement that into a game space and I got to say, every one of these, each class I go to, I'm curious about, I'm interested in. I've even thought about how if this place actually existed, I would I would be a straight A student. I would be absolutely floored that this was the school that I was going to and these are the types of experiences that I would get to have. It's, it's just, and I think that's honestly part of the secret sauce of the world that J.K. Rowling has put together is it's this world that everybody would love to be a part of. It, it, it's just filled with so much um, enchantment and splendor and wonder, lots of whimsical charm, danger, that sort of thing. 
but um, she was able to be successful in terms of bridging the real world with her magical world. So in, in, in terms of Avalanche Studios, like they too were able to tap into that. And so I mean, I've been having just a blast. Like there, there are so many things to discover and I love how they've been pacing me with, okay, now we're going to introduce you to this. And then I get to kind of play around with that for a little bit. And then all of a sudden, oh, I, now I have to go to this class and I'm going to learn something else entirely. And, oh, this ties into that thing that I just learned over there. And so, I mean, my, my interest is peaked all the time as I'm playing this game. Now, another thing that is worth mentioning is there is a section within the menu system called talents. And it was grayed out for a while, and I discovered that you have to get a certain uh, way through the main story, the main quest, and then that unlocks. What's really nice about that is you can then go into the talents, which consist of spells, dark arts, core, stealth, and room of requirement. And that unto itself is also super cool because then you're basically choosing and customizing different types of upgrades for like your core spell casting or you know if you wanted to actually dabble a bit into the dark arts you could do so you have your your stealth if you want to be more of a pacifist the room of requirement is actually a location that i have just found today and wow what a neat again what a neat part of the game where you find the secret door you go in and all of a sudden, you know, I, I don't want to spoil too much of it, but like essentially it becomes your space to be able to experiment with different things, be able to, to brew potions without having to go to the classroom. Um, so many different things. And you get to, to customize how it looks. And I like the, the accessibility of how you can customize this space to make it your own and tailoring like every type of workbench that there are with like the colors and how large or small you want them to be. And you can put mirrors and paintings on the walls. You can even like adjust the architecture. So, you know, if, if there's a certain type of banister that you're not crazy about, you can change that. If, if the floor is not to your liking, you can go through different varieties of floors. It's, it's just amazing to look at. And, and once again, to, to experience this space that you can make your own. And I think that that's what's really cool within Talents is that on top of all of that, then you can also customize, for instance, Rooms of, requ of Requirement is one of the subsections, one of the, the children of the parent of um, Talents, that you can then spend these talent points on. The talent points are directly correlated to your level. So basically every time you level up as a character, it unlocks another talent point and then you can spend it within any one of those, those categories. So that is super fun because I was up to like, let's say like I was like level 14 or so and I just wasn't aware of how to unlock talents and I was, to be honest, I was just having fun running amok. Like I wasn't actually going through and, and um, checking out the main quest so much as I was doing side missions and doing a ton of exploring. And so I think that's re what's really nice about this game too is that the game is not linear. You can pick and choose what you want to do first. And if you decide you don't want to uh, pursue the main quest and you'd rather just like go all over the world, which by the way, the world is big. This is a big open world. At first I thought it was just limited to the castle of Hogwarts and then the town of Hogsmeade. But then as I'm looking through the map, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this thing, this is, this is way bigger than I thought it was going to be. So that's also really nice is that once I discovered or I reached that point in the main quest, it then unlocked talents. And what's nice is that I didn't forfeit any of the talent points. In fact, it's quite the opposite. The game accumulates in the background all these points for you as you level up so that by the time you get to that, that um, part of the, of the main story, you can then have like, I think for me, I, I think the, the talent points begin, I think they, 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 they begin to accumulate once you hit level five. So I had 
I don't know, maybe like nine or ten points to to be able to distribute. And so that was that was a, a, a good feeling. I had a positive experience from that. In addition to talents, they also have what's called challenges. And so you have your combat, your quests, exploration, field guide pages. And once again, the room of requirement also has its own types of challenges. So that is a whole other ball of wax that I've just barely tapped into. But like basically as you go along, there are certain types of challenges that um, if you complete like basically they have like these, these little timelines, these little like progress timelines and you'll hit these checkpoints. And as you do, you'll be able to gain rewards from some of those challenges, which is also nice. I mean, it acts as, as an incentive for me as a player to be able to go through and get comfortable with these menus. Because when you first start playing the game, I was pretty overwhelmed by how many menus there are and how, like how many levels they go down. And I was just, I found myself kind of going, okay, I need to kind of <laughs> step away from that part for now. I'll focus on just the core gameplay itself. And then come back to that later and what's nice is is that the game does kind of act as a bit of a guide for you but it doesn't just show you everything at once and overwhelm you it actually once again it just it, it doles it out over time which I appreciate I really do like that and now I feel way more comfortable in perusing like the the, the different menus now one of the other um, critiques that I did have with the game was toward the beginning. So you have the sorting hat, which I thought was great, right? That's like, that's one of the most memorable, to me anyway, one, one of the most memorable aspects to Hogwarts is when new students get to sit down and then they place the, the sorting hat on the head and then they get assigned to one of the four houses. And for me, I was really excited for that part of the game because I was thinking, okay, if I'm designing this game, I would love to have fun with being thoughtful about the philosophical and sociological nature of questions. But unfortunately, this game, I think, only asked me like maybe two questions, two, maybe three. I don't remember exactly, but I mean, it was really short. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh, you know, you get to go into a certain house. Now, to its credit, it was interesting how it did select Hufflepuff and like literally every test I've ever taken, I'm always put in Hufflepuff. I think there's maybe like one or two times when I took some test on like Facebook or something and I was actually in Gryffindor, but that was very few and far between. I mean, by and large, I'm, I'm definitely the, the house of Hufflepuff, but I really wanted there to be um, maybe like say 10 questions, like make it more involved. Ha and don't have the questions be easy to figure out where it's like, oh, I bet, you know, this is if I answer it this way, then I'll be more likely to get into Ravenclaw and so on and so forth. Like, I, I want the, the questions to be very cryptic in nature. So that way people have to like ideally uh, like answer it honestly and then see where they get sorted in, because then I feel like there is more of that acceptance into that particular house. Speaking of the quarters, this is another part of the game that I think is absolutely fantastic. So when I got to check out the, the Hufflepuff place of residence, it is fantastic. I love the art direction, the design of the space, how you have other fellow Hufflepuff students walking around and like, you know, the, the vibe of the environment just it lends itself to just being very much a Hufflepuff space. And I got to say, I don't recall in the movies of Harry Potter, we ever seen what the Hufflepuff quarters look like. I think it, that we were able to see a little bit of Slytherin. Maybe we saw a little bit of Ravenclaw. I, I mean, it's been a while since I've seen the films, but I, I'm pretty sure like we never got to see what Hufflepuff looked like. So having said that, looking at what they did with the game, I, I just, I love it. I, I think it's great. The colors are terrific. I love all the, the little uh, magic 
items like like the, the little uh, I don't know what you call it the the watering pots or whatever that are like you know they're they're taking care of all the plants by themselves and I don't know I just I, it just puts a smile on my face I, th I think it's, it's a lot of fun. Another aspect that's worth mentioning is the PS5 haptic feedback. So I bought the game for the PlayStation 5 because I was curious to see if they would take advantage of the controller because in my view, the PS5 controller is very innovative, especially when you have developers that take advantage of the technology within that controller. And they have to a certain degree, at least in the, the 10 hours that I've played so far, and it, it really does help with the immersive factor. Even like when it comes to the audio, I'll walk by a cat and all of a sudden I can hear the cat purring in my controller as opposed to the speakers of my TV. Or if I um, cast, um, I think it's, it's pronounced a Loomis, basically like your little <laughs> wand flashlight, you hear that sound emitting from the controller. If there are certain types of... Um, casting that you're doing you can feel certain types of rumblings going on within the controller so everything that i have witnessed and experienced with the controller makes me glad that i chose the ps5 as the platform to play this game on and it's becoming increasingly more so because i think a lot of these third-party developers are getting more comfortable with how to use the tech for the controller and take advantage of those things because if you like, I don't know if, if you've played Astro's Playroom, that's one of the, the that comes with the PS5, and it's a great showcase of what is possible with the PS5 controller. The new Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart is another great example of that I mean, they totally take advantage of the controller, and once again, it just makes for that memorable experience. It, it's something that you like. If I go back to playing on Xbox. The controller itself, you know, it does have the, the rumbles and stuff in there, but it's unfortunate that they did not innovate on their controller in the ways that the PS5 controller has been innovated upon. So I think that there will be more and more games that I purchase for the PS5 as opposed to the Xbox just because I can get a more optimized experience from, from that perspective. So... I've said an absolute ton about this game and I guess what, what I can tell you all is that I, I highly recommend this game. I think that this is a delightful surprise for me personally. I did not expect the level of quality from the trailer that I saw and I'm so glad that I picked this up. I'm very curious to see how the, the game progresses. I think one other critique I do have is the main villain seems to be a bit lackluster. I think I would have preferred a different villain entirely because the one they have in this one, he's a, a goblin. And for whatever reason, I just, he, he looks almost like more like a mini boss or like a, a mid story boss as opposed to like the end all be all villain. Now, who knows? Maybe someone else comes stepping out of the shadows that I'm unaware of. Who knows? I, I don't know. But just what, I, what I've seen so far, um, I'm just like, yeah, I kind of wish that there was a different character entirely for that one. You know, well, another aspect that I think is really, really cool was the, the troll attack at, in Hogsmeade. I mean, that was one of the biggest... Uh, battles I have um, come across so far and it again the, the combat is epic it's a lot of fun to do and the amount of different types of, of animations and strategy involved with uh, fighting different types of enemy classes it's it's a lot of fun so if you haven't checked out this game I definitely encourage you to check it out um, I think it's a, it's definitely a feather in the cap as far as the, the Harry Potter license is concerned. And I look forward to, to exploring and discovering way more into this game than what I've seen so far. So we'll just have to see. We'll see how much time it takes me to, to get through it. But what a great surprise. What, what a, a just a, I don't know, 
I love being proven wrong with stuff like this because then I, as a gamer, benefit. And uh, hopefully I can pass it forward to, to anyone else who maybe um, is on the fence and they're not sure if they should try it out or not try it out. So anyway, that wraps up this episode of Joygasm. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. If you enjoyed this episode, I invite you to check out patreon.com slash joygasm where you can enjoy exclusive perks and early access to the show. Not to mention, it financially helps me doing or continue doing the podcast. Also, click on that subscribe button as well as that notification bell. That way you will not miss a single episode of Joygasm that drops once a week each week. And if you are so inclined, you could do a search for at joygasm TV, which is spelled J-O-Y. G A S M T V on your favorite social media platform of choice to be able to keep tabs on what it is that we're looking at over here. And last but not least, you are invited to go check us out on Twitch. Just do a search for Joygasm TV, and we stream our gaming adventures live every Wednesday night at 9 30 p.m. Central Time. I'll see you next week. Thanks again for hanging out.